thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and the excellent conference, which I've enjoyed so far. Um, and so this paper is joint work with uh, my regular collaborator, Rani Lil Anyam, who uh, was unable to be here for this. Uh, and it's part of um, a project that we're just a few years into the project, but should eventually result in a book, uh, which is uh, under contract with Oxford University Press. Uh, and it's a book on free will and turning Friedrich Nietzsche on his head, uh, the book is going to be called The Power to Will. The reason it's The Power to Will is that it will be an attempted solution to the free will problem based on the metaphysics of causal powers. But what I say today won't be too much about causal powers, it's more going to be on emergence. Um, because I, I'm going to offer the suggestion that free will is best understood as a strongly emergent causal power of agents, causal power or cluster of powers that are capable of exerting a downward causal influence. And the talk will mainly concern what, what we think would be the right theory of emergence for such a, a solution to the free will problem. Uh, and then I'll also um, spend a lot of time explaining how I think that account of emergence would deal with the issue of downward causal influence. And then I'll say just a little bit at the end about how this will uh, apply to the free will problem. Um, and a starting point uh, which uh, I think ag agrees with what Uva said, uh, was it yesterday or this morning? It's, it's becoming a blur in his talk. It, it is a, an attempt, a, a naturalistic at attempt at emergence. So it's answering, for instance, uh, Galen Strawson's so-called objection from bruteness. Uh, this is an objection to the notion of emergence, and it's basically saying that uh, we can't just have emergent phenomena appearing as a brute fact. Um, there, ha there should be some explanation of them. Um, because the, the, it seems there has to be some intelligible sense in which we're saying the emergent phenomena E is emerging from its base phenomena B rather than it being something else, such as rather than the emergent phenomena being just free-floating, in which case the, perhaps they wouldn't even qualify as emergent. Uh, if you've just got some base phenomena and then some, some other higher level phenomena and you can't explain any connection between them, then that's what I mean by free-floating. So the, the account I'm going to offer you now is an attempt to explain how we, we, well, in, in hopefully an intelligible sense of how you can have high-level phenomena emerging from some base-level phenomena. So, section two, understanding emergence. So we're aiming for a, an account of strong emergence. Now, um, I have sometimes experienced a frustration which I believe is a commonly held frustration, and it's a frustration I believe I've already heard expressed at this conference, that when people speak of emergence, they could mean just about anything. There's a, a broad range of ideas as to what would count as emergence. And I've been to conferences on emergence where it's clear that there's been countless concepts of emergence going around. So, um, I'm quite aware that uh, philosophy still has a, a job to do, I think, to regiment or codify or ex make explicit exactly what we mean by emergence. I think there is some uh, broad consensus on the sorts of things that should qualify as, as uh, emergent. So it's, there's a notion of novelty, for example, the idea that the emergent phenomena display some kind of novelty but perhaps without explaining exactly what that novelty is. And we are looking for strong 
emergence as opposed to merely epistemic emergence. So this is a, a commonly drawn distinction between weak and strong emergence where uh, some phenomena is weakly emergent uh, just if it's um, surprising or interesting but perhaps could be explained in principle. Whereas strongly emergent phenomena are often defined as uh, inexplicable even in theory. Now we don't like, by we I mean me and my co-author, we don't like that kind of way of drawing the distinction uh, because even the strong emergence is still defined in epistemic terms. It's defined in terms of something that you don't know or you, you, couldn't, you couldn't predict the emergent phenomena even if you knew all the facts. So I'm going to proceed by offering some prima facie cases, cases that are arguably emergent. And then I'll uh, discuss a, a couple of um, quite naive theories as, as what, what, what could count as emergence. Uh, but then I'll go on to offer our theory and claim that it could account for the cases that we think prima facie may be emergent. I say it could account for them, of course it will all depend on the empirical detail in, in the end, as you shall see. So here are some significant cases where I think there's a there's some good, good prima facie reasons to think some kind of emergence might be going on. So if you consider the case of life emerging from lifeless components that could be a case of emergence so i am uh, i'm a i have a physical body and it's made of some fairly mundane chemicals and yet uh, they have formed this wonderful thing that you see in front of you this uh, biological living Thing. So, how has that happened? Well, one answer would be emergence. Mind emerging from mindless components. So, neurons don't think, they don't have beliefs, and yet they seem to have formed a mind which does have those things. Meaning emerging from meaningless components is another case where I think you might, it might turn out to be uh, that meaning is an emergent phenomenon. The case that most interests us here, free agency emerging from nomologically ruled components. And then there's another case which I think is very interesting and, and I'll use this case to exploit an, an analogy at the end. Social phenomena emerging from individual components. So it seems that there are some social phenomena that are in, in some way beyond the control of the individual people who make up those societies. Now there's one little thing I need to, to even get this going, which is the idea of relatively higher and lower level phenomena. Now I think that distinction is pretty problematic. Um, what constitutes higher and lower level phenomena? I, I don't think it's just size, for instance. There's no reason why an electron is a lower level phenomenon than a star. Uh, just because it's smaller than a star. Okay, so I think it's, it's not easy to explain what you mean by higher and lower level phenomena. And also, I, I don't like the idea of a kind of a stratified view of nature, that it's, it's full of these discrete levels. So I'm going to work with a, a, what I hope is a relatively inoffensive notion of levels, where... Uh, I'm just going to say that one set of pheno um, if one set of phenomena composes or jointly composes another set of phenomena, then the first is relatively lower level than the second. So as it turns out, an electron would count as lower level than a star because it, it, uh, some stars are made of it, well, Okay, so all stars have got electrons in them, but not all electrons have got stars in them. As far as we know, though, it would be an interesting universe if that were the case. But as far as we know, stars are made of atoms, atoms are not made of stars. 
so the atoms come out lower level. Right, so we've almost got everything we need to get going, but one other thing that I'm going to mention, because it is going to shape some of the things that I'm going to go on to say. So Yagwon Kim sets out two challenges for any theory of emergence, and I think they're fair challenges. Well, certainly one is. Uh, first, he says that emergence is defined in negative terms. It's defined in terms of, of what it's not. So it's often said that uh, there's some higher level phenomena that's not reducible to the lower level phenomena, therefore it's emergent. Now there's a problem there in terms of uh, unification of explanation, if, if I'm defining something in, ter in purely negative terms, because the negative things are not a, a unified set. So if I just, if you think of all the things that are not red, it's a very diverse group of things and it seems it would be hard to find, find them theoretically useful in any further explanation. So if we can only explain emergence in terms of what it's not, it's not, not reduction. So it's, it involves uh, non-reducibility, then it seems we've, we've got a, a weak account there. So the challenge is can we uh, define emergence in positive terms? The second challenge he gives us is, can you show that emergent phenomena are not epiphenomenal? Uh, in particular, how could we explain their downward <coughs> causal action without violating the principle of causal closure? So we're going to try to give a, an account of strong emergence that's stated in positive terms, that's going to say what conditions must be met in order for a phenomenon to count as emergent. Uh, and then I'll, I'll go on and explain uh, where this leads us in, in relation to causal closure. So, I'm building gradually up to this positive account. So, I'm going to start by giving some cases that are almost right, but not quite cases of emergence. Uh, now, like Jessica Wilson, who, she has an account of emergence, and I will refer to it uh, a bit later, but... Uh, we would share with her account the, the thought that it's most helpful to articulate claims of emergence in terms of causal powers. Now, um, anybody who knows my work knows I'm absolutely crazy about causal powers. Uh, I, lo I love causal powers, right? So that, this would be no surprise to anyone who knows my other work. Um, and also, I, it means that I've got this tendency to sometimes speak of properties and powers interchangeably. So I'm making use of uh, an account. Sidney Shoemaker has articulated this idea that a property is just a cluster of causal powers. So, but if you don't go for that, you, whenever I say power, you could just think property. Or if you're really into the powers, when I say property, you could just think, well, it means a power. Um, so she, she articulates it in terms of powers. Un, unlike Jessica Wilson, we, we actually are believers in power. So we're, we're prepared to adopt a, a robust realism about powers. And one of the reasons is that we think it's then helpful when we, we, we're going to get onto the topic of the causal autonomy of emergent phenomena. So it seems we do want to preserve some connection between properties of things and their causal powers. Whether you think it's as strong as an identity as, as I do, that's, you, may, you may think it's a weaker connection, but most people will accept there is some connection between a thing's properties and its causal powers. So that already gives us the basic idea, which I'm going to have to try to make more precise. But the basic idea is going to be that particulars have causal powers or properties, but because things can be parts of larger things, these powers will sometimes compose to make resultant powers. So think of cases where component forces are added, such as when a, a group of people all pull on a rope. So there's some kind of composition going on there. And what we're going to argue is that emergence is what occurs when you get a very particular kind of, of composition. 
The basic idea is going to be that emergent phenomena are those where the wholes of powers that are not possessed by their parts. Now, some people think of this in, uh, uh, as a common idea behind emergence, that the emergent phenomena are those where the, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. And we're going to say something significantly different from that. Um, now, the challenge is to make that basic idea into a, a credible theory. We want an ontologically serious notion of emergence, but also one that doesn't make it too ubiquitous. So there are some accounts of emergence which would allow you to find it almost everywhere. We don't want emergence on the cheap. For instance, composition alone would be too weak if we, th we consider mere composition. So Van Gulik uh, calls something specific value emergence. And this is where for example, something weighs 10 pounds, though none of its proper parts do. So there the whole has a property that the parts don't have, which sounds close to the basic idea. Should that count as emergence? Well, arguably not, because if it did, it would make so many things emergent. It would give us such a weak concept of emergence that emergent properties would be found almost everywhere. And if we're trying to develop a theory that fits some of the pre-theoretically plausible cases of emergence, such as on my list, that wouldn't seem to be useful for them. So, it's just giving us a mere aggregation. It's giving us a property that results from the mere aggregation of the parts. We want something better than that. Van Gulik also offers something he calls modest kind emergence. And this is where the whole has a property that's different in kind from the parts. But again, I'm going to say that this is too weak. So an example of this that again, I'm going to say is too weak. If you consider the case, if you have two triangles, and you align them correctly, if it's the right kind of triangle, you can make a square. And this isn't mere aggregation like adding together weights. So this is a case where uh, the whole has a property of squareness that none of the parts have. Should this count as emergence? Well, again, I'm going to say there's insufficient novelty there. It's a bit more than ag mere aggregation of the parts, but it's aggregation with a kind of spatial alignment. And again, if this were to count as emergence, it would give us emergence on the cheap. So, what we need is some kind of, again using Van Gulik's terminology, a radical kind emergence, where the emergent properties are of a radically different kind from those found among the base phenomena. So it's not just an, uh, an aggregation of the parts, it's not just an aggregation of the parts with spatial alignment, it's got to be something else. And so we offer, for your pleasure, what we're calling the causal transformative model. So I'm going to give you the basic idea, explain a, a couple of examples, and then I'm going to give you a long list of advantages of this theory. Uh, and then once you're all convinced by that, I'm going to go on to talk about causal closure, in case you're worried that that's still the problem. So the idea would be that there are some novel powers or properties of the whole that emerge from the parts of, of the components causally interacting, where those parts are changed through their causal interaction. So let me give you an example. And I think that this is basically an example that John Stuart Mill had, uh, has discussed in System of Logic. Uh, and I'm not a specialist in history of philosophy, but I think 
Mill's system of logic is one of the earliest things we've got that resembles the, the modern uh, debate on emergence. So consider um, chemical bonding. In forming the whole, the parts have to undergo changes. And these changes can explain why the whole has powers that are not among the powers of the components. So here's a nice dramatic example. Chlorine is a poison gas. So it has this poisonous power. You don't want to be near it. Dangerous. Also, sodium ignites spontaneously on water. It's also a, a dangerous substance. It has this uh, power to ignite. Now, if you were some kind of, uh, I don't know, if you're the kind of philosopher who thinks that all, all composition is mere aggregation, you may infer that the combination of sodium and, and chlorine is going to be so dangerous, you never want to go anywhere near it. Because it would, if, if it is a mere addition, then it's both poisonous and can ignite spontaneously. But we find that if they are bonded in a certain way, they give us sodium chloride, which have, has neither of those causal powers. It's got a completely different causal power. It tastes salty, and none of its components do, I, I would expect. Um, so, what's happened there? Well, there's been a chemical bonding, which I would argue that the, the bonding process itself is a causal interaction which leads to a change in the constituents. Now, let me give you an even simpler example, the simplest example that I think we could probably have. Um, so, water has a power to put out fires. But none of its components do. In fact, there they would have the opposite power. Hydrogen and oxygen would actually fuel fires. So you don't want to throw the components on the fire, but you do want to throw water on the fire. And we understand, even I understand, uh, that the reason the whole has a power that is not just a power of the parts, is that those parts have undergone a transformation through their chemical bonding, because we all know that the bonding occurs uh, when the atoms share an electron in their outer shell, thereby completing those outer shells, making a, a stable compound. And given that the vacant spaces on the outer shell of electrons are partially responsible for the behaviour of those components, then once they're bonded, it shouldn't be a surprise that the behaviour of the whole is different. Now, this case satisfies our definition of strong emergence. And a notable thing about it is that it gets us emergence in a perfectly natural way, a naturalistic way, a perfectly scientifically knowable way, um, which puts it at variance with many other accounts of emergence, which uh, suggest that emergent phenomena are going to be inexplicable. If it's strong emergence, they've got to be inexplicable in, in principle. And emergent phenomena are going to be unpredictable in principle. Whereas on our account, uh, we may not know all the details, but in principle, there is a naturalistic explanation there. So emergence, this is where I agreed with Uwe yesterday, doesn't require any resort to a deus ex machina, whether that be literally a godly intervention or... Um, as, a, as in some, some accounts of emergence, uh, maybe CD, pro, CD Broad is like this, where it just, the emergent phenomena are just there without any further explanation. Which we would claim is the first advantage of our account. It contains no epistemic element. 
So in principle, we could know how the emergent phenomena uh, does emerge from its base phenomena. So life, for instance, there are people, who, uh, biochemists, who, who work on how life emerges from chemical components. Um, and uh, I can offer them reassurance that their life's work is not in vain because it's, it's not as if this is, is a unanswerable in principle how life can emerge from lifeless parts. Second advantage, and this, this is an advantage over Jessica Wilson's uh, subset view of, emer of emergence. So Jessica Wilson has this view where a, a property is a cluster of causal powers, but the emergent phenomena is going to be a subset of that cluster of causal powers. And the problem, well, here's a notable difference from that view. So in her view, there is no power in the emergent phenomena that is not a power of the base phenomena because the emergent phenomena is just a subset of the powers of the base phenomena. Whereas we can offer genuine novelty, so this, this initial feeling that emergence is about novel phenomena, we can give an account of why that is. It's that the whole has a power that is not a power of the parts and this arises through the causal interaction of the parts and the subsequent change of the parts. So the power of our emergent phenomena on our account isn't a power of the parts at all. So that's where your novelty comes from. The third, third advantage. We think we give a, a more credible account, again more credible than Jessica Wilson's account, of the causal autonomy of the emergent. Um, the, uh, the claim of the autonomy of the emergent phenomena in a subset view, I think, can be questioned. Because although a proper subset is distinct from the whole, it's arguable, well, I think it's, it's true, that it's not wholly distinct from that whole. Um, it is indeed just a subset. So in what sense could the emergent powers be autonomous from the base? It still seems they're restricted to the base powers. Whereas we're looking for something in the emergent phenomena that isn't in the base phenomena, and it's a new causal power, and this is going to be exciting for what comes later because it would offer some uh, backing to the claim that the emergent phenomena have, have causal autonomy from the base phenomena. Fourth advantage of our account, it's a characterization of emergence in entirely positive terms. So this answers Kim's first uh, problem. It's telling you what has to happen for emergent phenomena to occur. It's uh, it explains how the emergent phenomena depend in some sense upon B, but they're not reducible to B. But we're saying more than that. We're saying that these positive conditions have to be met. The emergent phenomena has to have a new power, uh, which is different from any powers in the uh, base phenomena. And final advantage I'm going to claim, which I think is a really important one, this is a serviceable conception of emergence. What I mean by that is not too many things come out as emergent on this theory, but not too few things either. Um, and also it could plausibly align with the cases that pre-theoretically seemed the sorts of things that would be emergent. So if I think of social phenomena, for instance, there's a good reason to think social phenomena are emergent, and our account explains why you might have that feeling. Because a society is not just a plurality of individuals. Essentially, a society has to be a, a plurality of interacting individuals. So if we were just a plurality of individuals confined to boxes where we couldn't interact, 
at all, then I don't think we can constitute a society. What makes us a society is that we interact with each other uh, and I change you in our interactions and also you change me. So we're a society because of our, the fact that we interact. So the account seems serviceable in, in so far as it, uh, it seems usable, it seems applicable. And I think this is especially important in um, the case of emergence because emergence is um, a philosophical quasi-technical term, if not wholly technical term. It's not one that's in, uh, as we use it, it's not the same as how uh, non-philosophers in the street would speak. Uh, and it's also quite a young philosophical concept. So I've said, going back to John Stuart Mill, I'm not a historian of philosophy, so if somebody tells me there's a, a medieval philosopher who said all this, then I will believe you. But I'm thinking it's, it's, it's relatively new in comparison to something like causation. When we're coming out with theories of causation, I think there are more constraints in that it's been discussed since at least Aristotle. So it's got this long history that we have to acknowledge. And also, uh, regular non-philosophers, the other people, uh, use causal vocabulary all the time. So I think there are constraints there. Whereas with emergence, I think it's still up for grabs. You know, so if like me, you've, you've, you've heard philosophers talk about emergence and realise they've all got different con concepts of emergence going around, I think that shows that it's, it's still, there's work to be done and a, uh, a job to, to regiment this and get everybody talking about the same thing. So, let me move on then to causal closure because you could say, well, that's all well and good, but I'm not going to believe that there are these emergent phenomena with this causal independence that you're claiming unless you can tell us a plausible story about causal, the principle of causal closure. So that's what I'll now attempt to do. And it's more than just doing this to solve a problem. It's also because the reason I'm interested in emergence, there is going to be an ultimate payoff in the case of free will, which seems to require downward causal a action. To be, to be precise, that mental phenomena seem able to, to act on physical phenomena. So... How, if at all, can we explain downward, the downward action of emergent properties without violating a principle of causal closure of the physical? So if you're an emergentist about mental phenomena, it seems that you want to allow that those uh, psychological states could affect your physical chemical states. And this does seem very uh, plausible. So something else I work on is philosophy of medicine. And there are many cases where higher level phenomena such as psychological states can have make big physiological changes. Um, now, I've been told it's best if I stay close to this microphone, but I did have something written on the board. It's okay, I can, I can explain from here. There, so there I've got some base phenomena, B and B star. And they, these phenomena base these emergent phenomena, E and E star. Uh, now, this shows what the problem is that we have, because su suppose I say that there are some base phenomena that ground E, emergent phenomena, and I'm trying to claim, uh, well, E has got, now got causal independence because it's, it's properly emergent. It's got some causal independence. Suppose I want to say that it's, it's capable of causing E star. Well, there's a problem there because E star looks to be based upon B star. So in, in uh, many of the discussions, this might be put in terms of supervenience. Um, now, I actually don't think that emergent phenomena supervene upon their base phenomena, but that's because I've got some interesting views and on other things. If anyone wants to ask me about that, they can. Uh, 
but I'm, I'm at least going to say that uh, B star looks to be causally responsible for E star. So then it, it looks as if E is not capable of being the cause of E star. It looks as if the story that would have to be told is that B may cause B star uh, through um, some people call that horizontal emergence which passes through time but then B is constitutive of E which people call vertical emergence so it, it looks as if there is a problem and that, that's the problem of, of one way of understanding the, the causal closure of the physical it's saying that there is just no room for E even if it is an emergent phenomena to have any further effects either on B star on, or on E star so it seems the emergentist has got to either provide good reasons why causal closure is to be rejected or show that her account of emergence does not violate causal closure. And it's partly in answer to this problem, uh, the reason why Jessica Wilson opts, opts for the subset view, which is going for choice B there. So she, with the subset view, she's claiming that her account of emergence doesn't violate the principle of causal closure because the powers of E are just a subset of those of B. Hence, there is a sense in which uh, both E and B can be causes. So she's kind of saying that an effect is systematically overdetermined by E and B, but without violation of a principle of causal closure. And she calls this non-reductive physicalism. So she's, she's admitting that it isn't strong emergence. Um, but we've already argued for strong emergence. So um, it, seems we've got to, we've got, it seems we've got to say something. Well, here's what I'm going to say. And I've just been given a five-minute sign, so I've got to be quick. Uh, First of all, I'm going to say, I don't think that causal closure of the physical is really what's at issue here. Now, causal closure of the physical, that seems to look the problem when you're thinking specifically of the case of emergence of <laughs> mental phenomena from physical phenomena. And there we may feel we have to defend the completeness of physics. But I'm going to set the mind-body problem aside for the moment. Because I want to point out that there are other uh, cases uh, of emergence that are clearly separate from the issue of physicalism. Um, so if physicalism is just the thesis that everything is physical, it's not threatened by emergence in many other cases of emergent phenomena, where the emergent phenomena are physical. So I gave you the example of life emerging from lifeless parts. Well, a biological organism, it's alive, but it's still a physical thing. Uh, and it's, um, and also saying it's a physical thing that has causal independence from its parts. Well, that's not a threat to physicalism then. Similarly, I've heard physicists talk about something they call the quantum hall effect, which I don't understand, but they allege it's an emergent phenomenon. But again, the emergent phenomenon is physical, as well as the, the base phenomena that produces it. So it's not essentially a question of the causal closure of the physical. What I think is an issue is the causal closure of the microphysical. This is what's causing the problem. What emergentism threatens is the idea that all the causation is going on at the microphysical level, at the base level. And what I'd say in response to that is, um, well, what I'd say is that we've been through the arguments, we've looked at the case for emergence. And if we believe there are good reasons to, to accept that our emergent phenomena with causal powers that are distinct from the powers of the parts, then we've already had that discussion. We've already accepted that what's going on at the microphysical level is not the whole story and there is something at a higher level which is causally relevant. So don't raise it as if it's a subsequent objection to the theory that 
well, what about a, a, a principle of causal closure of the microphysical? I've already explained why I think the microphysical story is not the whole of the story. Now, what, what this leaves us with is that we, we want to say it's philosophically plausible what everybody believes all along. So, for example, if, um, if a friend asks you to go and get them a bagel, now, if, you're, if you just try to predict someone's future position in 20 minutes' time, just from knowing the position of all the particles in their body, well, good luck to you. But if I know that they've been asked to go and get a bagel, then if I think of higher level phenomena, if I understand the norms of meaning and social engagement, I understand the meaning of the words, I understand a person's psychology, I know that they want to be friendly and kind, I've got a pretty good chance of predicting where they're going to be in 20 minutes. They're going to be in the bagel shop. So there I'm only concerned with causation at a higher level. Okay, so what does this tell me about free will? Well, to explain free will, I think we do, we are going to need a whole theory of mind. We're going to need uh, a theory of um, what's needed in order for someone to act freely. And if this is going to come out as emergent, we also need to show that those mental components of free action are ones which have emerged from non-mental parts. But that doesn't sound too implausible. We have a, a capacity to have beliefs and desires. Uh, and um, I know that beliefs and desires are not held by neurons, but I can see how it may be empirically plausible that uh, through their causal interaction and changing each other, mental phenomena could emerge from physical phenomena. Um, and once created and set free, such emergent powers exert downward causal influence. So I'd, I certainly want to say that I can decide to take my molecules out of this room. It's not that my molecules are going to make, carry my mind kicking and screaming out of the room and I'm thinking, no, no, I don't want to leave, but my body carries me out against my wishes. Now, suppose you think this is still a bit implausible. There's still something that's not been explained. So, yeah, I'm going to finish with this analogy of the social again. Uh, and this is why I think it's important to acknowledge social phenomena as uh, emerging. Because it illustrates everything that I've been talking about so far. So, first, let's start with the case of emergence. So, uh, invoking Wittgenstein's private language argument, which I'm sure is a surprise for this stage of the talk, uh, but I'm persuaded that a solitary individual could not be a language user. Uh, but what happens once we have societies, individuals come together, they can change each other's behaviours, they can inform, uh, inform and enforce a normative system such as language. So we have this emergent phenomena of language. This is, uh, so we are able to be language users only because we are parts of a larger whole. But once that whole is constituted, once language is constituted, it has a degree of independence from the users. So an individual user can no longer, is incapable of deciding to change the meaning of a word, for instance, and just using their own word. Furthermore, the language seems capable of exerting a downward causal influence on the individuals who originally composed the society that made the language. So, um, when a, a new word comes along, um, I don't know, I, if, imagine you, when you first come across the word hubris and you learn the word hubris, and this may affect me in the future, I might use the word hubris. So this has had a downward causal influence on me. It's, it's changed me when I've acquired from the language this new concept. So I want to exploit that analogy of Lots unsaid, lots of detail not being stated, but uh, a lot of that detail will be empirical, but I also accept that we still, still owe you some philosophical detail about how 
the mental phenomena that are required for free will. I haven't said anything about that yet, although I do have views on it. So if it comes up in the questioning, I, 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 I'm happy to talk more about that. But for now, I think I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Professor Mumford. We now invite uh, Mr. Michael Bauwins from the University of Leuven up for a response. Okay, good afternoon everybody and thank you to Professor Mumford for his stimulating paper. Um, in the very small but I think real metaphysical possibility that none of you will have any question to ask to Professor Mumford, I am the last man standing between all of you and dinner. Hence, I have numbered my questions. There are four of them in total, so you can easily track how far off from dinner we still are. Here's the first question. Um, why have levels at all? And now you're careful, you know that it's a problematic notion, so you don't, don't want to employ too strong of notion of levels, but I remain unconvinced or in doubt. For even if you go to a weaker form, like jointly composing, you seem to be still metaphysically privileging small parts to larger holes. But why would bars be metaphysically paramoidal to holes? Is your account of immersion ultimately, ultimately a form of Democritian atomism plus powers, with powers forming the glue to account for the atoms grouping together and forming holes? But if the hole that emerges out of the parts has new and distinct powers, it is quite possible that it can retain those powers when losing some parts and acquiring new ones, all the while maintaining its own unity. We can then easily get to a case of thesis ship, where a presupposition would grant that the whole has remained the same in virtue of its immersion powers remaining the same. <coughs> but then the idea of immersion becomes, at least for me, intuitively problematic given the connotation of the term immersions with a bottom up process or with part whole relationships. Can you speak a bit more slowly? Okay. <laughs> um, for in the case of living beings like us, uh, who actively seek out parts in our environment, to be taken up in our whole, especially if these parts are jointly composed pizza-wise, it's rather odd to say that the whole emerges out of the parts as if the parts are doing the real metaphysical work, whereas for living beings it is the whole that is doing the work of taking up these parts into its own. So human life does not emerge out of throwing together 70 kilograms of molecules. If you look at human embryogenesis, we see two incredibly tiny parts uh, coming together in what you would probably grant as a case of causal transformation, i.e. fertilization. But the initial result of that is for a lot of people, apparently no human person at all, or we wouldn't have 40 million abortions per year. However, what follows is a very slow and gradual process whereby the powers of the human embryo take up more and more parts, actively. The whole is doing the, part, the work, not the parts. And it seems to me that talking about living holes emerging from non-living parts, or in this case, human persons emerging from non-human person parts, is at least loading the conceptual or imaginative dices against the case for accepting life as irreducibly real, which I think you're uh, aiming for. Second question, and connected to the previous one. Why do we need emergence at all? Um, so here's C.B. Martin from his The Mind in, in, in Nature, a book you, uh, you know very well, and I quote, The interrelatednesses and interactivenesses of parts as reciprocal partners bring a conjuries of dispositions into mutual manifestation, namely those parts that could not be manifested if they existed separately and without such interrelatednesses. To give the parts a less impoverished description is only to give them their due as interactive parts, and when this is done, Having levels of being and speaking of the whole or the system as having supervenient and emergent properties and causality between parts and wholes no longer remains plausible." End quote. So my question here is, given your affinity with Martin's model of mutual manifestations of recipro reciprocal disposition partners, why do you need at all to talk about levels of being, even in its weak form, or about emergence at all? So in your example of the chemical bondings of atoms, why talk about the whole having emergent properties and instead of simply saying that these atoms are mutually manifesting whatever dispositions for these mutual manifestations they always already had? You talk about the powers of the components, quote, being changed by, the, by their participation in the whole, end quote. But why wouldn't that simply be a manifestation of whatever reciprocal powers or dispositions are involved? Or if it is the same, 
is a reason why you don't call it like that in this paper. For on the other hand, you also write that, I quote, until the causal transformation, those emergent powers do not exist in the base phenomena at all, end quote. And that means, I presume, that these emergent powers also do not exist as iterated or iteratable powers in the base phenomena. But if not, why not? Third question. Why not have uh, life and mind and meaning and freedom or any other desirable emergent property at the base level, or at least in a position of metaphysical primordiality? You seem to be committed to at least some form of naturalism or methodological naturalism, but we know there are problems even with that. Um, so to what extent is your account of emergence only relevant for people sharing some form of naturalist metaphysics? If the base level of reality is not some lifeless, mindless, meaningless matter, but a highly living, minded, meaningful and free being like God, how would that affect the debate or your account? So just to give it a try, and since I already came out of the closet as a Platonist last night during dinner, um, for the Neoplatonists, the big problem was to, go, to get from the ultimate transcendent one to something messy and plural-like material reality at all. Um, and for Christian creation theology with Creatio Ex Nihilo, it is far less problematic to get from an omnipotent, living, free, conscious being like God to created material reality than to get from lifeless and mindless matter to living and thinking beings. Um, so I'm not an expert in creation theology, but even metaphysically, it's, I think it's far less problematic for living, conscious and free beings to eventually appear within a material reality created and sustained by a living, conscious, free being like God. As Aristotle knew, like produces like, and creates reality would somehow come into its own at the moment of the appearance of life, consciousness and freedom, instead of being this metaphysical conundrum. So just to try out an analogy, uh, created reality would metaphysically be more like a divine womb in which human life is quite likely to originate, even fully granting the autonomy of created reality, for example, in evolutionary processes. And for those who prefer it, it would even be a very politically correct analogy by pointing at the mother-like qualities of God having a womb to contract the patriarchal image of God as a father. Um, now, of course, you have to start somewhere, but if going top-down is so much easier than going bottom-up, why make things needlessly difficult? Perhaps there should be a variant to Occam's razor going like this. Philosophical problems should not be made more difficult without necessity. Mm -hmm. So if naturalism has, after all these years, even failed to account for the kind of conscious, living, thinking beings like, well, naturalist philosophers, why not drop naturalism? And as a brief theological aside, since we discussed the metaphysics of the Incarnation during lunch. Um, it wouldn't be too problem problematic to have one of those living conscious human beings um, be the same person as the divine creator behind reality, thereby, so to speak, piercing through what is but a thin veil of material reality. Um, and thereby the, the, the resulting metaphysics of hypostatic union we would have a fully human nature of Christ and a divine nature of God united in one divine person. For as the Roman and canon lawyers put it, a person can be subsumed by another person, but a nature cannot be subsumed by another nature. Or in the case of um, corporate finance, it's a case of merger and acquisition, or acquisition uh, more precisely. Fourth and final question. I'm not convinced by what you have briefly said about downward causation partly because of my skepticism towards the levels metaphor to begin with, um, which makes the whole idea of downward causation uh, problematic from the start. So the example of uh, me or you taking molecules out of the room, well, I think a lot would depend on your metaphysics of the self or the subject or even the soul that should be doing the downward causation. Uh, more than a decade ago, John Searle wrote that, I quote, with the greatest reluctance, I have come to the conclusion that we cannot make sense of free will, of reasoning, of human action, and of rationality generally, without an irreducible, that is a non-human notion, of the self." End quote. Now, you're clearly not a fan of David Hume, uh, but to the extent that you would indeed have a naturalist metaphysics uh, in the background, would you also have the greatest reluctance to accept an irreducible self doing the downward causation? For if an irreducible self can survive changes in its component parts, it's just one small step for one's metaphysics, 
but one giant leap for one's overall philosophical life to accept the immortality of the soul, especially without a strong a priori commitment to naturalism to begin with. But without an irreducible self, it's not clear to me why me taking my molecules outside of the room would be a case of downward causation rather than being a very complex cloud of molecules moving through rooms like a kind of tiny sandstorm or molecule storm with a bunch of interacting powers. I'm also not convinced by your example of language. All that would be happening there is a complex molecule sandstorms diachronically interacting with other complex molecule sandstorms and indeed thereby influencing each other's behavior and dispositions, but I don't see a whole or the need for a whole exerting downward causal influence on the language speakers, other than the mere group of other language speakers. And to finish, um, what I think would be an interesting ca candidate, an extreme candidate for downward causation in some form, is one whereby the properties of a substance are synchronically changed instead of being merely diachronically interacted with. So to go back to a theological case, and sorry that Andrew Pinson is no longer present because I think it's special divine action need keeps philosophy from being, becoming dull, consider transubstantiation. Um, and as an answer to Professor Berkman, I think that would be an example of the mechanics of divine intervention. So what we have is a human mind instantaneously changing the substance or the powerful properties of bread and wine through a free speech act, thereby becoming the body and blood of Christ. And it's clearly not a case whereby the hands of the priest or the sound waves coming out of the mouth of the priest are somehow diachronically modifying the bread and wine by saying, hoc est enim corpus meum. Actually, you have to whisper it, hoc est enim corpus meum. And then you get to the hocus pocus. Um, or the, the, the British children's song, do the hokey pokey, do you tur tur and uh, you turn yourself around. That's what it's all about. Um, now, for the empirically minded among you, you can even look at the scientific evidence for the many Eucharistic miracles that happened over the course of the centuries, whereby a consecrated host turns into blood or human tissue, even many among of which in the 21st century. And then you don't have to rely on first century New Testament eyewitnesses for those miracles or speculate about the fossil record. It might also sort out some interesting debates among, let's say, different Christian denominations. Um, of course, given that a priest is acting, almost done, <laughs> is acting in persona Christi, he is acting in the divine person of Christ, and thereby, strictly speaking, the transubstantiation is effected by Christ through the priest, but contingently upon the free decision and action of the priest to offer mass and say the words of consecration. So it might not be pure cause, pure case of downward after all. But in any case, if you want a nice place where miracles, free will, emergence, downward causation, and theological controversies coincide, just have a look at transubstantiation. The Reformation started 500 years ago. It's about time we settle some of these issues. Thank you. Professor Mumford. Thanks, Michael. I, I knew that would be really good and uh, <laughs> I wasn't disappointed. So it's given me an awful lot to think about. I can't possibly do justice to all the issues you've raised there. Um, levels. Well, I, I hoped that I was uh, saying something neutral and inoffensive enough because it's basically just part-whole relations is all I've got. And um, you could think of, uh, when I say a high-level phenomena, you could think of that as um, shorthand for me saying uh, a phenomena uh, of a whole that's not uh, a phenomenon of the parts, which is, it seems it was just going to be a bit more unwieldy to, to explain that, but, but, but basically it's, it's, I've, I think all I've got is part-whole relations, so I d didn't want a stratified nature. As, as you suggest we shouldn't. Why emergence at all? Well, it's a, it's a fair proposal, but I, um, I do find something lacking in, in Charlie Martin's mutual manifestation account. Um, so I, I, I actually used earlier the example of the two triangles forming a square and suggesting that it's not a case of emergence. Now, coincidentally, that's the very case Charlie Martin offers us. So actually, it's not a coincidence that that's in the account because we were reacting to that account. Uh, what I thought was missing from the story was the, the transformation of the parts. 
Now, you didn't raise this point, but that's one of, one of the two reasons why I think uh, we would deny the supervenience of the uh, emergent phenomena on the base phenomena, partly because once you've got the supervenient phenomena, the base phenomena don't, don't exist anymore in the form that they had prior to their participation in the whole. They've undergone a change, so you can only say the square supervenes on the two triangles if the two triangles still exist at the same time as the, the square. Um, life, mind at the base level. Oh, that, that, that led you on to the discussion of naturalism. And yeah, I'd, so over the last couple of days I've been thinking about this and um, whether uh, th this account is consistent with uh, theism. And I mean, my, my view on this is. Um, I think that if you can explain emergent phenomena naturalistically, then you might as well do so. You know, there's, there's no point multiplying miracles beyond necessity, is there? There's, there's no point saying, this, well, this, uh, this is a result of a godly action. I suppose it, it is consistent with, um, you know, there could be some cases where God did um, add something. Um, for example, for for the emergent phenomena to have occurred at the, at the first place, and and of course when I'm when I'm talking about life emerging from lifeless parts, I am talking about a, an old historical story. I'm not, I, I don't I'm not sure it's applicable to the case of a, a conception of a new a new child because that's that's more a story of once the organism is exists and then is self replicating. Um, but so the, the components that began interacting, well, it did require a coincidence, namely that those necessary components for the emergent phenomena got together in the first place. Uh, now, if you, if you were to tell me that that was a result of divine action, then that would be one account of how it happened. Um, now, irreducible self and so on. I, that's why I said I'd, I did want, or uh, I, I recognised that there needed to be a theory of mind, and, and a theory of the self. Yeah, I, so I was slightly annoyed with myself that I didn't persuade you that uh, the the mind would become more than just this collection of, of molecules. So yeah, I, d I do want there to be a unity. It, Emergence, the whole attraction of emergence is that it is a form of holism, it's against reductionism. So clearly uh, there's more work to be done to convince someone who feels that uh, the unity of the self is lacking from this account. Okay, I'll, I'll